Um, so I have two texts, so I get 10 minutes. Uh, but I will burn through this quickly. So I chose Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam by Bruno Latour, first published in Critical Inquiry in winter 2004, because it is a compelling critique of critical theory, one that I want to critique in turn. Latour begins with the culture wars of the last few decades, in which critical theory took an obvious beating, and asks, is it really the task of the humanities to add deconstruction to destruction? More iconoclasm to iconoclasm. What has become of the critical spirit? Has it run out of steam? His ostensible worry is that critical theory has aimed at the wrong targets, train recruits for wars that are no longer possible, and fought enemies that are long gone. This military language allows Latour to touch briefly on the status of the avant-garde. Interestingly, he suggests that this notion was displaced long ago now from political practice to artistic practice. Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried made, it, made a similar point almost 50 years ago that for many on the left, hope for the perpetual revolution proposed by Trotsky had shifted into faith in the perpetual innovation demonstrated in modernism. Latour suggests a further displacement in the avant-garde from our artistic practice to critical theory, this one not, not so long ago. And I think this is right. Certainly it was the radicality of critical theory that attracted many of my generation in the first place. Foucault, Derrida, Barthes, Deleuze, and others were the avant-garde for us. But today, Latour says, that critical spirit is gone. Why? His first explanation is that its central weapon, its argument that everything is constructed or conventional, is now co-opted by the right, who turn this argument against the hard facts of science and history alike, who even mock us naive folk as reality-based, as Karl Rowe famously did over the deadly fiction of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So Latour argues on this point, let me just read a, a line uh, or two from the text. It says, entire PhD programs are still running to make sure that good American kids are learning the hard way that facts are made up, that there is no such thing as natural, unmediated, unbiased access to, to truth, that we are always prisoners of language, that we always speak from a particular standpoint, and so on. While dangerous extremists are using the very same argument of social construction to destroy hard-won evidence that could save our lives. In response, Latour urges, now that, that uh, critical theory is co-opted by its enemies, to bring the sword of criticism to criticism itself. His second reason for the evacuation of critical theory is that it is betrayed by its own generals. This is his term. And he calls out Jean Baudrillard and Pierre Boudieu by name. That is, for Latour, social critique is often degenerated into conspiracy theory, pure and simple. Here he has an easy target in mind, the flagrant accounts of the 9-11 attacks as the stagecraft of the State Department, Israel, or whatever. Nevertheless, one understands him when he writes, and here's my second little passage from the text. I find something troublingly similar in the structure of the explanation, in the first movement of disbelief, and then in the wheeling of causal explanations coming out of the deep dark below? What if explanations resorting automatically to power, society, discourse, had, out, had outlived their usefulness and deteriorated to the point of now feeding the most gullible sort of critique? His third explanation for the gutting of critical theory is also familiar borrowed from the French sociologists Luc Boltensky and Yves Chiappello, who argue that the new spirit of capitalism 
has put to good use the artistic critique that was supposed to destroy it. That far from the old Protestant work ethic, what contemporary capitalism requires are artistic types, adept at the manipulation of images and texts, at interdisciplinary connectivity and social networking, handy, as Latour puts it, with the most sophisticated tools of deconstruction, social construction, discourse analysis, postmodernism, postology, whatever that is. <laughs> That's his little mocking of us post people. So it is that Latour thinks that a certain form of critical spirit has sent us down the wrong path. And his response, well, he says, the question was never to get away from facts, but closer to them, not to fight realism, but to renew it, especially when it comes to matters of concern, like the realities of global warming and the necessities of healthcare. Above all, he calls on us not to debunk or to deconstruct anymore. For Latour, the rational de demystification of the Enlightenment has turned into the mad destructiveness of critical theory. Instead, we are urged to protect and to care. Note the, the shift in language here. It's not so militaristic now. In fact, Latour urges us, like a Kleinian kid, to pass from destruction to reparation. And there is a way in which Latour sees critical theory as Lenin once saw left-wing communism as an infantile disorder to be set aside. In the end, the Latourian critique of critical theory boils down to this. The, the critic pretends to an enlightened knowledge that allows him or her to demystify the fetishistic belief of naive others, to understand how this belief is a projection of their wishes onto a material entity that does, does nothing at all by itself. Here for Latour, the fatal mistake of the critic is not to turn this anti-fetishistic gaze on his or her own belief, that is, his or her own fetish of demystification, a mistake that renders the critic the most naive one of all. Latour concludes, this is why you can be at once and without even sensing any contradiction, one, an anti-fetishist for everything you don't believe in, for the most part religion, popular culture, art, politics, and so on, Two, an unrepentant positivist for all the sciences you do believe in, sociology, economics, conspiracy theory, genetics, evolutionary psychology, semiotics, just pick your preferred field of study. And three, a perfectly healthy, sturdy realist for what you really cherish. And of course, it might be criticism itself, but also painting, bird watching, Shakespeare, baboons, proteins, and so on. Latour writes as a historian and theorists of the sciences. I should have mentioned that right away. For Jacques Ranciere, too, I was also asked to introduce his essay, The Misadventures of Critical Thought, though I did not select it. Critique is compromised by its dependence on demystification. In its most general expression, Ranciere writes, critical art, and here we shift from critical theory to critical art, Critical art is a type of art that sets out to build awareness of the mechanisms of domination, to turn the spectator into a conscious agent of world transformation. Yet not only is awareness not trans transformative per se, Ranciere continues, but the exploited rarely require an explanation of the laws of exploitation. Moreover, critical art asks viewers to discover the signs of capital behind everyday objects and behaviors. But in so doing, only confirms the transformation of things into signs that capital performs. Like the critic for Latour then, the critical artist for Ranciere is trapped in a vicious circle. Yet much the same can be said of our two metacritics. Latour replays the ur-critical move of Marx and Freud, who argued as follows. You moderns think you are enlightened, but in fact you are as fetishistic as any primitives. Fetishists not only of the commodity, 
but of any object you desire inappropriately. To this reversal, Latour now adds his own. You anti-fetishistic critics are also fetishists, fetishists of your own cherished method or discipline. In this case, demystification, deconstruction, etc. To this extent, then, he remains within the rhetorical coils of the very critique he wants to cut. Rancière joins, <coughs> excuse me, Rancière joins in this challenge to the hermeneutics of suspicion at work in, a, in critique, a la the Frankfurt School. Yet not only is this challenge a familiar one within critical theory, it was also fundamental to its own shift from a search for hidden meanings to a consideration of the, the conditions of possibility of discourse, as in Foucault, of the significance of textual surface, as in Barth, and so on. Moreover, Ranciere condemns critique for its projection of a passive spectator in need of activation. This is his version of the naive believer in need of demystification in Latour. Yet Ranciere, too, assumes this passivity when he calls for such activation beyond mere awareness. Finally, his famous phrase, his famous motto, the redistribution of the sensible is a panacea. And when pitted against the capitalist transformation of things into signs, it is little more than wishful thinking, the new opiate, opiate of the art world left. All this said, and I'm about to conclude, one understands the fatigue that many feel with critique today, especially when taken as an automatic value, it hardens into a self-regarding posture. Certainly its moral righteousness can be oppressive and its iconoclastic negativity destructive. These are the Latourian points. Against this image of the critic, Latour offers his own. The critic is not the one who debunks, but the one who assembles. The critic is not the one who lifts the rugs from under the feet of the naive believers, but the one who offers the participants arenas in which to gather. The critic is not the one who alternates haphazardly between anti-fetishism and positivism, like the drunk iconoclast drawn by Goya, but the one for whom, if something is constructed, then it means it is fragile and thus in need of great care and caution. Who could not warm to this figure of the empathetic critic? It's such an ethics of generosity introduces a problem of its own, which is in fact the old problem of fetishism. For here again, the object is treated as a quasi subject. Recent art history shows a marked tendency to do much the same thing. Images are said to have power or agency, pictures to have wants or desires, and so on. This corresponds to a similar tendency in recent art and architecture to present work in terms of subjecthood. Although many practitioners in both fields aim to promote experience, phenomenological experience, often what they offer is the near reverse, experience returned as atmosphere or affect in spaces that confuse the actual with the virtual or sensations that are produced as effects yet seem intimate, indeed internal nonetheless. Examples range from James Turrell to Oliver Eliasson in art and from Herzog and de Meuron to Philippe Rome in architecture. In this way, the phenomenological reflexivity of seeing oneself see approaches its opposite, an installation or a building that seems to do the perceiving for us. This too is a version of fetishization, for it takes thoughts and feelings, processes them as images and effects, and delivers them back to us for our appreciative amazement. As such, it calls for precisely what Latour and Ranciere want to reject, which is anti-fetishistic critique. I think my time's up. <laughs>